Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away. Tonight, Ottawa gives permission for select visitors to skip quarantine. I do worry that it might um, undermine some of the efforts to actually adhere to the public health recommendations. The billionaire U.S. political donor who got an exemption. If three staff members had COVID, then who is to say that students didn't catch it too? And Ontario High School closes because of COVID-19. System under strain. Is it time to approve at-home tests? You know, this is just, I mean, clear your throat <coughs> and spit into a little cup. Pretty low tech. Those long lines are taking a toll. And Canada's unsung NBA star busts out in the playoff bubble. Murray puts up the three. Bang! Jamal Murray takes down Kawhi. Next up, LeBron. This is the National. Since the start of the pandemic, we've heard the warnings about travel and COVID-19. The Canada-U.S. border remains closed. Visitors are required to quarantine for 14 days. But a CBC News investigation has found Ottawa has quietly handed out dozens of exemptions. These aren't for essential workers like truckers delivering goods or medical professionals. These special exemptions are for travelers who arrive in Canada and are allowed to skip quarantine. The federal government won't reveal who has received them, but our investigative team has discovered one curious example. Jonathan Gatehouse has the exclusive details. In late August, three executives of U.S.-based company Uline arrived in Toronto on a private jet for meetings at their Ontario office. The American travelers, including CEO Liz Uline, didn't isolate upon arrival. They didn't have to. Liz Uline founded the shipping company with her husband Dick, a conservative billionaire couple with deep political ties. But most especially to Liz and Dick Uline and the incredible men and women of Uline. They're currently the Republican Party's biggest financial backers, giving more than $40 million in the past two years. Two of the most influential donors uh, nationwide, so they're a big deal. Liz Uline has been critical of pandemic restrictions, calling them a huge disruption and telling the Guardian newspaper COVID-19 is overhyped, not the message Ottawa has been sending Canadians, more than a million of whom have been forced to quarantine when they have returned home from abroad. CBC News has learned that police visited Uline after receiving a complaint that the executives weren't wearing masks and were holding large meetings with staff. Halton Regional Police declined to comment. A spokesperson for Uline said that they were granted a special exemption for a two-day facility visit at their sprawling Milton location. In a statement to CBC News, they said the executives were formally exempted from the quarantine requirement and fully abided by the terms of the admission. Only four cabinet ministers and the chief public health officer have the power to issue an exemption from quarantine, and only in exceptional circumstances. But Ottawa won't say who gave Uline an exemption or on what grounds. The shot they have revealed that hundreds of ministerial exemptions have been issued, most of them going to professional athletes with the NHL and MLB. But in 70 other cases, the ministries will not say who got them or why. It becomes a bit of a slippery slope. You grant one exemption, um, you know, people might start interpreting the rules a little bit differently. I do worry that it might um, undermine some of the efforts that we have for people to actually adhere to the public health recommendations. Not something this country can risk, as case numbers again tick higher with each passing day. Okay, Jonathan, sorry for the vast gulf here, COVID. Um, you mentioned that pro athletes are among those who've been granted these exemptions, but that there are some 70 others. Who are they? Well, we're not quite sure who they are, but we know who they're supposed to be. Under the law, these exemptions are supposed to be granted under exceptional circumstances for people that should be here in the national interest or people whose presence is crucial in the fight against COVID-19. An example we were given was someone who would come to Canada to fix ventilators for hospitals. There's also another part of the act, and that is a bit of a gray area. It's an exemption for business mobility, and we're not sure exactly what that's supposed to mean. And so the people who can grant these exemptions, there are some ministers, and who are they? There are four of them, the Minister of Public Safety, the Minister of Immigration, the Foreign Affairs Minister, and the Minister of Health, and also Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Theresa Tam. She's granted five of these. 
Now, we've gone to all of these people and asked if they were the ones who approved the people in our story, and they won't say. All right, I know you're going to stay on this. Jonathan, thanks very much. Thank you. We're just on the cusp of flu season. The kids are barely past the classroom doors, and the number of new daily cases just keeps climbing. Across Canada, there were 944 new cases reported today. Ontario had the most, with 315. That's the highest number since early June. Ontario's Premier is promising to tighten restrictions around social gatherings and bring in stiffer fines. There's going to be some severe, severe fines for people who want to ignore uh, the, the regulations and the guidelines, so it's going to be severe. They're going to be the highest in the country. The upswing in cases and the return to school has led to long lineups at COVID testing centres. Katie Nicholson looks at what needs to happen to change that. Emma Marascotti started her phone timer when she got in line for a COVID test. I thought maybe two hours, but I understand it may be another hour here, so up to four hours to be waiting, it's ridiculous. I do apologize for the long wait. I'm going to try and get you guys in as quickly as possible, okay? Nearby, security guard Jerome Paul tries to calm frayed and impatient nerves. We do have a lot of people that are waiting in line over for two to three hours. Uh, it does suck. But there are solutions out there to improve wait times. One of them just hasn't been approved for use in Canada. The evidence is there. And this is not fancy, you know, this is just, I mean, clear your throat <coughs> and spit into a little cup. Uh, it's pretty low tech. Dr. Dick Menzies is wrapping up a review of 23 studies on rapid saliva testing. His conclusion? Saliva sampling turns out to be as good, maybe even better, uh, certainly as good as nasopharyngeal swabs for COVID. And it's something that anyone can do from home and pop in the mail. But Health Minister Patty Haidu isn't yet convinced. We're just not there yet. We have not had a test submitted to Health Canada for approval yet that satisfies the regulators' concerns. Ottawa does say there is more money for testing in its $19 billion safe restart agreement, which might help. Hi. Hi. Welcome to our pharmacy. Another idea. In Alberta, pharmacies have been taking some of the load off since June. More than 500 pharmacies there are conducting up to 3,000 tests every day. Ontario's Premier says very soon the private sector is going to jump in with thousands of new testing sites. We're ready, they're ready, and we're just going to ramp up the testing like you've never seen before. Until then, Jerome Paul will be busy doing a little more of this. I do apologize for the long wait, okay? Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. And just days into September, COVID's already derailing back-to-school plans. While infections were always expected, the hope was to isolate and contain them quickly. But today, an Ontario high school shut down entirely after three positive cases. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson explains why. Back to school began just six days ago at this Pembroke High School. Now its doors are closed again. A school closure, uh, temporary in nature, uh, as a result of the ongoing investigation related to the three uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 on site. The three cases are all staff, now 650 students out of class. If three staff members had COVID, then it was to say that students didn't catch it too, you know? In nearby Ottawa, Misty Pratt is keeping an eye on her daughter's school. The city has already seen cases in 10 different schools. Another friend just told me that they had a case in their school and they're in our board um, and it's close. She's most worried about keeping her kids safe, but the prospect of shutting an entire school down over three cases is also troubling. If this happens in our school, that's all it takes to shut the entire school down. And then for how long and uh, what are we doing at that point? It's a worry many parents share. Today, 250 kids at a Winnipeg school were sent home after seven positive COVID tests. In Ontario, 35 schools reported at least one case, according to the province's tracking website. But the public health official who decided to close the Pembroke school says it wasn't the number of cases, but the potential exposure. At midday today, with a little further, further investigation, we realized that the third person was involved in other classes and we were hearing of more people with symptoms 
So we basically thought we were behind things. Experts say a handful of cases doesn't necessarily mean a school will close. In other instances, we'll probably see uh, one or two people go home and isolate with maybe a handful of close contacts. And in other instances, we might see uh, classes or cohorts go home to, for, for isolation. The Pembroke School will be testing all staff and 90 students. No word yet on when the school will reopen. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Quebec joined Ontario in reporting more than 300 new cases in a single day. And like Ontario, that's disturbing but not surprising. Over the past month, average daily case rates in Quebec have more than tripled. And while the number of COVID patients in hospitals remains relatively low, the fear is it won't stay that way. As Allison Northcott explains, with more activity moving indoors, options for stopping the spread are running out, and so is time. An unusual start to the school day in a school year already far from normal. Public Health set up a clinic to test 300 students and staff after several cases here. Quand on revient, ça recommence. We just came back and it's starting again, says this parent. It's hard and frustrating. My son was crying because he wanted to return to school, she says, but he's one of several students isolating at home instead. It's one of more than 200 schools dealing with at least one case of COVID-19 as the number of cases across the province continues to rise. Premier Francois Legault says gatherings between friends and family are driving transmission, but said it's hard to police what happens in private homes. There's a real risk that we need to close schools, companies, uh, so please respect uh, the, the two meters and wear a mask and uh, don't have parties uh, at home. And he says he's not ruling out stricter measures. 25 residents at this retirement home in Thetford Mines have tested positive for the virus after a visit from a hairdresser who turned out to be infected. It means for us that we have to be more careful for all visitors, all workers, uh, all uh, families, uh, residents, um, to enforce the sanitary measures. Monica Jess left her job as a nurse after a grueling experience and seeing many die in a long-term care home last spring. The virus hit nursing homes hard. I was putting my kids and my father-in-law in danger, she says. Eventually, she'd had enough. A Radio Canada analysis has found hundreds of nurses have left the profession since the pandemic began, adding to the concern as the province tries to keep the virus under control. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. The pandemic is also taking a toll on politicians. Two federal party leaders are now isolating, along with several MPs. Catherine Cullen shows how COVID-19 is complicating next week's return to Parliament. A distanced and handshake-free meeting on Monday between the Conservative leader and Quebec Premier. We need families to be well here in Quebec and across the country. Little did Aaron O'Toole know, someone on his team would come down with COVID. Now he and his family are being tested and are isolating. François Legault says he's monitoring for symptoms. And the Bloc Québécois, Yves-François Blanchet, is isolating too. His wife tested positive for COVID and one of his staffers, meaning some Bloc MPs are isolating as well. The result, half the main party leaders could miss next week's much-hyped return of Parliament and throne speech. Already there's been disagreement about how many MPs ought to physically be here, particularly for that crucial confidence vote on the throne speech that could trigger an election. The Prime Minister insists on caution. It's having 338 MPs converge on Ottawa from every corner of the country is probably not uh, what we'd want to see from uh, our leadership in this country. Except no party is actually calling for that. We do not want to send all 338 members of Parliament back. We know that that would not be safe. Though the Conservatives do argue if kids are back to school and other legislatures are sitting, as many MPs as possible should be in Canada's Parliament. But noting that one employee with Parliament Hill's Protection Service also recently fell ill and was in contact with 19 other employees, some are pushing for prudence. 
The reality is if, if one member of parliament catches COVID-19 and gives it to other members of parliament, those members of parliament could be spreading it uh, into their constituents. There's also a spat over allowing MPs to vote virtually or online. The Conservatives have compared it to the dating app Tinder, saying a vote in a democracy shouldn't be such a casual thing. I think it'd be very irresponsible for us to put something forward if we don't know how it's going to work. They'll have to figure it out soon. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Once again, the U.S. president is at odds with health officials and his own team on the coronavirus policy. Today, he was contradicted by White House senior staff and the head of the CDC. But when it comes to Donald Trump's re-election chances, does any of it matter? Katie Simpson takes a look. The president has, at times, been out of step with his own staff and experts on the fight against COVID-19, a gap that is only getting bigger as Election Day inches closer. We're very close to that vaccine, as you know. The president says a vaccine could be ready next month with mass distribution by the end of the year. But one of the country's top doctors says the wait for the general public will be longer. I think we're probably looking at third late second quarter, third quarter, 2021. It'll be announced fairly soon. Without citing evidence, Trump said that's wrong. I believe he was confused. I, I'm just telling you, we're ready to go. Trump's team spent the day walking back more contradictions. The president um, has always supported mask wearing. That clarification um, came after Trump questioned the value of masks fragile. at an We're ABC News town hall last the night. There are a lot of people think the masks are not good. Claims that, that again that contradict his own expert. People. This face mask is more guaranteed to protect me against COVID than when I take a COVID vaccine. Good afternoon, everyone. Democratic presidential challenger Joe Biden says the confusion is harmful. I trust vaccines. I trust scientists. But I don't trust Donald Trump. Americans' opinions about Donald Trump have been set. But don't expect this to hurt Trump's popularity as his core supporters stand by him. He has a dedicated base of supporters that make up about 40 percent, give or take, of the electorate. I think the cake is just baked. People's attitudes are, are set in stone on Donald Trump and his administration. For every day the president clashes with his team, it takes away from time he could be laying out his vision for the country, as would happen in a traditional campaign. Trump has shown he's not interested in traditional strategies. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. The catastrophe of Boeing 737 MAX 8 is well documented. The two devastating crashes, 346 people dead, including 18 Canadians. But now a landmark U.S. congressional report gives a scathing account of how it happened. The report zeroes in on a new system in the plane, MCAS, with a fatal flaw. It documents the warning signs about it ignored and concealed by Boeing, but it also details the grossly insufficient oversight of regulators. As Thomas Degla shows us, this was about far more than a faulty system on an aircraft. It was about the faulty system of aviation safety itself. While those Boeing 737 MAX jets took to the sky, there were mistakes and cover-ups on the ground. What's now described as a horrific culmination of failures that claimed hundreds of lives. Boeing tried to pull the wool over the FAA's eyes. The engineers didn't have sufficient time to solve a lot of problems. At the center of the problems was the troubled software MCAS. Pilots struggled to keep the aircraft's nose on course, a dangerous flaw that was uncovered, but then downplayed and hidden, according to a new U.S. congressional report. A test pilot needed an excruciating 10 seconds to determine how to handle MCAS in a simulated emergency. Circumstances that proved eerily similar to a deadly Lion Air crash in 2018, then the Ethiopian Airlines disaster five months later. It claimed the lives of Paul Giroge's entire family. The thoughts of uh, uh, my wife and my children in that aircraft and, and their final moments, you know, something that keeps, that's something that is there in my daily life. And the report blames not only Boeing's mishandling, but also the U.S. transportation regulators' mismanagement. Their relationship was so cozy, 
the FAA outsourced oversight duties to Boeing employees themselves. In a dangerous bid to cut costs, staff agreed not to emphasize MCAS as a new function because that would require greater certification and training. There is no independent body to oversee what, what they are doing. At what point can we hold uh, the principles within a corporation responsible? Boeing is producing 737 MAX jets once again, saying they're being thoroughly scrutinized. It's not just a fix to the hardware, it's also procedures and training that are being looked at very carefully. Seeing those jets in the sky again sometime soon will prove a painful sight for some. Thomas Dagg, Le CBC News, Toronto. Hurricane Sally is still being felt along the U.S. Gulf Coast tonight. Next on the National, Sally roars ashore, bringing life-threatening winds, water, and even wildlife. It is a 10 or 12-foot alligator. And fighting BC's overdose epidemic during a pandemic. These are all the pills that I take every morning. And the man giving Raptors fans a reason to cheat. Bang! Jamal Murray from downtown! Canada's Jamal Murray takes down Kawhi and sets his sights on the king. We're back in two. Sally is now a tropical storm, but it's still blasting the U.S. Gulf Coast hours after the damage it delivered when it hit land early this morning. Stephen D'Souza has the details. With force and fury... Wow, this hurricane is no joke. Hurricane Sally made landfall along the coast of Alabama just after 6 a.m., bringing some of the Gulf of Mexico with it. No idea where that boat came from. The storm hit the coast as a Category 2 hurricane, packing sustained winds of more than 165 kilometers an hour. My wife was just crying because she never seen this before too, and my kids were scared, and I told them it was gonna be okay. The storm knocked out power lines, leaving more than half a million people in Alabama and Florida in the dark. The wind was powerful enough to tip over this tractor trailer. Luckily, the driver wasn't seriously hurt. In Gulf Shores, Alabama, roadways became waterways. Buildings in low-lying areas were flooded, while some high-rises had walls ripped away. In Pensacola, Florida, part of this bridge is now gone. Where it wasn't wind, it was rain. In some areas, the storm was expected to drop anywhere from 60 to 90 centimeters of rain. I will tell you it's bad. Uh, it's going to take a considerable amount of time to clean up from this. In one neighborhood, the flood water brought an unwanted visitor. The high water conditions also made it difficult for emergency crews to help those who tried to ride out the storm. Because of the high winds, because of the amount of flooding that we're seeing, um, where our responders right now are having to stage because it's so dangerous. In one Florida county, more than 100 people were rescued. We'll either get a boat out there to pick you up or a high water vehicle. We anticipate the evacuations could literally be in the thousands. Sally has been downgraded. But as it lurches towards the Carolinas, the rain continues to fall, and millions are still at risk from potential floods. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. And in the western U.S., another weather disaster as crews continue to battle deadly wildfires. New evacuation orders were issued in California today as the Bobcat Fire near Los Angeles shifted direction overnight. In Oregon and Washington, weather conditions improved slightly with some scattered rain and cooler temperatures. Dozens of fires have burned millions of acres since August, killing at least 35 people and ravaging several small towns. Next on the National, BC's dueling health emergencies. We're gonna go code three lights and sirens. The challenges of fighting an overdose epidemic during a global pandemic. And later, Murray puts up a three. Bang! Jamal Murray from downtown. This is absolutely shocking. There he is. Canada's unsung NBA star gives Raptors fans a reason to cheer again.
In British Columbia's opioid crisis, the province is giving registered and psychiatric nurses a new way to help those at risk of overdose. Dr. Bonnie Henry has announced they will be allowed to prescribe safer drugs. Up to now, only doctors and nurse practitioners have that authority. BC has had a surge in overdose deaths, 758 since the province declared a COVID-19 emergency in March. Briar Stewart shows us how the pandemic has complicated the overdose crisis. We're heading down to the uh, 100 block of West Hastings. We're going to go call three lights and sirens. Through the streets of Vancouver, a rush to the scene. Now with a few extra precautions. As one health emergency exacerbates another that's been unfolding for years. So is he, is he awake and stuff? His eyes are open. This is one of a few thousand overdoses BC paramedics have been responding to each month. Why don't we give him a little more Narcan? On the middle of a sidewalk on Vancouver's downtown east side, a man is unconscious and struggling to breathe. Take some deep breaths. As in so many other cases, fentanyl is the likely culprit. And for those who survive, paramedics say it's now taking longer to revive them. Hey, sport. Hey, fuck off. Oh, okay, all right. Can you sit up for us? We want to make sure you're okay. It's the paramedics. We're giving these people high doses of Narcan, and they're starting to breathe, and they're not waking up. Is it okay if I take your blood pressure and stuff real quick? Brian Twaits is a paramedic specialist, yeah. trained to give advanced life support and frequently called upon to help crews respond to overdoses. The program was launched three years ago, not long after the province declared a health emergency because of drug deaths. It was a crisis then and is worse now. I think what we're finding is that it's more widespread. It's in all of the corners of the province. You're getting it in Prince George, you're getting it in Victoria, you're getting it in the interior. It, it's just picking up everywhere. Between May and the end of July, more than 500 people in BC have died of overdoses. The social implications of COVID-19 are one likely factor. Physical distancing means some safe consumption sites have had to shut down or reduce their space. And more people are using alone. Another cause, increasingly toxic drugs. Experts speculate border closures have disrupted the supply, leading some to concoct mixtures with additional chemicals. This one is uh, fentanyl, and we don't need much sample. We need about 10 milligrams or the size of a match head. Alan Custance is a spectrometer technician with Get Your Drugs Tested in Vancouver. He tests samples that are dropped off or mailed in from across Canada. You know, we get all types. We get people who are dealing, checking their substances, checking what to buy, or people who are uh, cutting their samples and trying to see what percentage that they've cut it at. After the border closed, Custance says he started seeing drugs with benzodiazepines cut in which, like fentanyl, also depresses the central nervous system. And it's fentanyl. You can see it just peeking out. Then he started noticing higher and amounts of fentanyl. Normally it sits around 5 to 10 percent. We were seeing, you know, 15 to 20, 25 to 30, so much stronger. To most people, that is enough to overdose, um, even a seasoned uh, user with a high tolerance. And did you use this one before, no, Matthew? No. Okay, so I'm going to say that one looks like a 10 to 15, maybe. There are a few other places where people can find out what's in their drugs before they take them. At this overdose prevention site, testing is available a few days a week and carried out by a team working for Vancouver Coastal Health. So be, be careful with that, Matthew, because it is a little stronger than perhaps you've had lately. Yep. Normally it's like 5% and this one here is 10 to 15%. So now that you know that's stronger, what does it change? I guess I'll have to do like, a, you know, three times less. And let's see how many fentanyl analogs we've got here. One, two, three, four, five, six, wow. seven, 
When Phoenix Beck McGreevy was trained to do the testing last fall, she hoped people would throw their drugs out if results showed they were stronger or contained unwanted chemicals. But that's not happening. She's both disappointed and empathetic. If you've spent your last $10 on it and there's any fentanyl in it at all, you're going to do that sample, whether I tell you that it's got something you don't want in it or not, because the sickness needs to be kept at bay. So the question remains just what can be done to prevent more people from dying? There's a growing call by some, including from the chiefs of police and BC's top doctor, to decriminalize illicit drug use. We need people who use drugs to know that they can come out of the shadows. But that decision rests with the federal government, so BC has gone a different route. At the end of March, the province expanded access to so-called safe supply, which means drugs like narcotics can be more widely prescribed to those struggling with addiction. Every possibility for how one can imagine creating more safety within this toxic drug supply, I think, is on the table right now. Dr. Ashley Heeslip works at two clinics in Victoria where roughly 80 patients are on safe supply. In BC, some doctors are writing those prescriptions in an effort to keep those addicted off of street drugs. But Heeslip admits access can be an issue, particularly in remote areas because not all doctors are comfortable prescribing the drugs. I think a lot of physicians are sitting with, uh, you know, a heaviness around making sure that whatever we step forward with within this pandemic prescribing context really is adhering to that doing of no harm. And they're weighing that within their own practice and their own experience of caring for their patients. And just because someone is given a prescription doesn't mean they will stay on it or even stay off of what they're already taking. These are all the pills that I take every morning. Inside each of these plastic packs are hydromorphone pills, synthetic opioids. Each day, David Keeler is given 28. He started taking them in March after getting a prescription, but still ends up turning to his dealer most afternoons. I mean, it just doesn't reach my addiction. It doesn't touch it. Maybe more than half of the people that I know that are on these are just looking to sell them. Shake them, dump them. So I'll take those right now, I'll take all of them. But... Keeler chooses to take them, and today washes the pills down with coffee. Two more, so. But he one. says the problem with safe supply is that people aren't given the same drugs they're addicted to. In his case, heroin, which he started using at 14. This is stuff people need to know if they're toying with it. The day I spoke with him, he was on his way to a memorial for three friends who died of overdoses. Give people what they need, because if they don't get what they need, they're going to go after it. And it's just going to continue. It's like it's just going to be a big ball getting bigger and bigger, rolling, keep on going. It's just a big, big, nasty, vicious circle, right? And it's never going to end unless we take care of it properly. And Vancouver's downtown east side is a searing reminder of the lows of addiction. On some evenings, paramedics respond to a few dozen calls in this city alone. Many in private residences and supportive housing. What we're seeing for the deaths when we find out about those calls, those people have already passed away by the time we get there. And quite often, they've done drugs by themselves. Excuse me. Hey, guys. That didn't happen here. Okay, that's probably good there. Thank you. In the early hours of the morning, a man collapsed in the lobby of a shelter. Even before paramedics arrived, staff rushed in to administer Narcan, or naloxone, an opioid antidote. And he's had some Narcan, is that correct? He's had four rounds of Narcan. Okay. When someone is resuscitated, paramedics say they're often confused, sometimes angry. We're just taking your heart. Okay. Why? Why? Because you weren't breathing. And usually refuse to go to the hospital. We have people that have overdosed so many times and have been resuscitated. They just get up and they say, no, I'm fine. You know, I, I, this has happened before. And they just walk away. That's sad because you want to get them the help that they need. Even when they do get in the ambulance, the relentless nature of addiction means there's no guarantee they won't find themselves here again. And next time, the outcome 
might not be the same. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. When we come back, forced to flee their country to save their lives. I was preparing myself to be exe like executed. A harrowing account of the dangers faced by protesters in Belarus and their message for the rest of the world. Belarusian authorities have officially charged protest leader Maria Kolesnikova with undermining national security. She is currently in jail. Kolesnikova is one of three women who've been leading a mass opposition movement, the only one not to go into exile. And so for more than a month in Belarus, thousands have protested the re-election of, Pre of President Alexander Lukashenko. They've been met hard by security forces, leading to accusations of brutality and torture. Chris Brown tells us about two demonstrators who saw that with their own eyes and, as you will see, felt it in their own bodies. Amir al Haider and Anastasia Shebek are struggling to recover from the violence inflicted on their bodies and their souls. They fled Belarus to a safer place in Europe to avoid arrest and now to recount the terrifying events. These special forces, they tortured uh, uh, all of us. I was preparing myself to be ex like executed. The couple's horror story began the night of August the 11th. They'd been offered a ride home by some medics during a night of protests in Minsk. But they stopped the car when they saw people lying face down with police standing over them. They threw a light grenade uh, underneath our car. They commanded to go out of the car and lay on the ground and they uh, used a weapon uh, like, a, like a gun, like a sh shotgun, a long one, and they put it in front of my face. Both were already supporters of the protest movement that's trying to sweep President Alexander Lukashenko from power. But they claim they were peaceful and didn't deserve what came next. I was beaten nearly 10 times, maybe more. I was beaten at the time of detention. I was beaten during the transportation from one point to another. Amir's injuries are hard to look at, but important to see. Many of us were sitting along the, along the prison, prison's wall, and they were, uh, they were uh, beating us, so I received maybe three or four uh, blows at that time. The violence has been inflicted at random, and women have not been spared. With sexual humiliation, part of the tactics. Anastasia says she was stripped naked and subjected to a humiliating cavity search. With these 15 hours, it was very scary that, you know, this is a complete unrighteousness that happens. We were like bandits, we took away to the hospital, and we took them into the forest and took them away from the forest. This video, put together by Human Rights Watch, was part of a report released by the group this week, which confirms Lukashenko's forces are responsible for what it called a systemic pattern of torture. The video features people with injuries that are hard to comprehend. Belarus's authorities claim such stories are lies. This is a state TV report where the reporter was taken on a tour of the same prison where Amir was almost beaten to death. Was someone beaten here, he asks? No, no one was beaten, said the policeman. They brought people in, put them in a cell, and that's it. The report went on to show the reportedly tasty food and comfortable beds for prisoners. There was no bullying or torture here, insisted the deputy chief. That's not fooling anyone inside or outside Belarus. The couple say they will not return to their home until after Lukashenko is gone, as they struggle with the aftermath of their ordeal. I saw people who are standing in white clothes and in white clothes, and I couldn't look at them at all. They hurt me. Then, loud sounds, some fireworks, they just scare me very much. Or people are running away, and you just want to hurt them. Now, 
Lukashenko met with Russia's Vladimir Putin this week and vowed there would be no compromise with opponents. But Amir says the ground has already started to shift. We are not in a position, we are at the majority now. And uh, Lukashenko and his team, they are in a position. And they only think they are, uh, the only thing uh, that helps them survive is the is, uh, weapons and uh, violence and loyalty of uh, policemen. Each weekend, the crowds in Minsk get larger, hardening the resolve of those who want change for their nation. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Ahead tonight, the provincial government now welcoming babies. But first... Great move by Murray, takes it in and slams it home. The Canadian NBA star having an incredible playoff streak and ready to take on the king. I'm Josh Block. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, as unprecedented wildfires rage across the western United States, a fire expert explains what's to blame and how we need to adapt to life with fire. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, this was Seattle today, shrouded in smoke from wildfires. The air quality continues to be so bad that the city's baseball team's two-game series against San Francisco was moved to the Bay Area. Well, the Raptors' NBA season is over, but Canadian basketball fans still have something or someone to cheer about because Ontario's Jamal Murray is having an incredible playoff run. Jamie Strachan shows us a 23-year-old who's been building towards this his whole life. Great move by Murray, takes it in and slams it home. For Jamal Murray, this year's NBA playoffs have been a personal highlight reel. Murray, long three-pointer. Already, Murray has led his team back from two three-games-to-one deficits, twice scoring 50 points. Murray, does he got another one in him? Oh, you bet he does! The latest victim, heavily favored Kawhi Leonard in the Los Angeles Clippers. Shot clock winding down. Murray puts up a three. Bang! Uh, everybody counts us out. Uh, and it's just fun to it's just fun to silence everybody. We love it. The Kitchener, Ontario native has dominated everywhere he's played. Murray, yes. Playing for his country. Under ten on the shot clock, Murray. And during his lone college season, playing for the storied Kentucky Wildcats. The Denver Nuggets select Jamal Murray from Kitchener, Canada. He recently signed a $170 million contract extension, the richest contract ever for a Canadian professional athlete. I've seen him perform at every stage of his career when, when he's had to, but definitely surprised at the numbers he's putting up. His old high school coach says Murray has been preparing for moments like these. He's very big on meditation. He's very big on visualization, and, and I think it's, it's truly, you know, he, he hasn't physically been here, but I guarantee he's played this through in his mind. Murray has also embraced an NBA season that's been about more than basketball. You have a picture of George Floyd on your right shoe here. You got Bianca Taylor. Why has why this been so personal for you, Jamal? Even though these people are gone, they give me life, they give me, uh, they help me find strength to keep fighting this world. He's from a great family, a very strong upbringing from, from his mother and his father, and He's got very, very strong um, political views on, on what's right and what's wrong. Another strong voice during this postseason, LeBron James. His Lakers will be Denver's opponent in the next round. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, the Newfoundland legislature made a little change to open its doors to some brand new faces. That's next in our moment. In the Newfoundland House of Assembly today, a small but ultimately significant change took place. Elected officials are now allowed to bring their babies to work. This was a unanimous decision, and of course, it's our moment. We should be speaking on things that matter to us as MHAs for our district and for the province. The only way you're going to normalize something is by having a presence. And by having an infant in here with a parent really will start to normalize it. And we talk about diversity, but we have to make sure that if we want women in government, we have to find a way that women can be present in government. 
And that leads to acceptance. It's not about giving women jobs. It's about giving women the opportunity to access the jobs. Changing this rule is not about just the infant. It's about actually normalizing infants in the workplace. We have to lead by example, and so we need changes. So this is a conversation that's been happening all over the world, some big changes. There are still places where uh, women get in significant trouble for doing that. There are places where it's opening up. The, uh, the House in Newfoundland uh, has 40 members, only nine are women, so they've got some work to do there. And part of that work is installing change tables in the bathrooms. That is a national for September 16th. Good night.